All right, welcome back. I'm here with Greg Pryor and Phil Wilburn of Workday. Gentlemen, thank you for being here. Thank you for being open to sharing. The topic that we're going to discuss uh, is something that I know we are all passionate about, and it's immensely relevant to not only the people, analytics, and future of work community, but to everyone in business. I mean, we have uh, COVID, you know, oscillating the return to workplace. We have diversity, equity, inclusion. We have employee experience. We have all this stuff that is gaining in prominence. And I know, Greg, you have a narrative around this with discussions with CHROs and how they're dealing with it. So I'm going to get out of the way and let you gentlemen take it. And I'll come back in about 30 minutes and we'll have a chat about it. That sound good? Hey, thanks so much, Al. All right. Enjoy. <clears throat> Phil, I will, I will let you maybe start with a quick introduction, my friend, although I think people probably already know you in this community well. So I lead people analytics. I've, uh, I've been, uh, you know, been on um, uh, Pafau a, a couple of times. Um, I think the most interesting thing to, that people don't know about me is that you actually hired me, Greg. So <laughs> you have that background. So you can, uh, uh, you know, I think you made a good decision. I don't know if you regret your decision, but I'm happy to, to still be here uh, uh, doing work and presenting with you. Well, Phil, you, you, you stole a bit of my thunder, my friend. I was going to say that perhaps my greatest contribution to my nearly eight years at Workday was hiring you. And so no doubt, uh, one of the best decisions I've ever made, and I'm so grateful to work with you. Uh, so maybe just a little bit about myself. My name is Greg Pryor. It's a privilege to be with everyone today. I hope that everyone is, is doing well and, and is safe and well. Um, I have been with Workday for nearly eight years, uh, pr primarily in sort of three roles, which may become relevant in a second. First and foremost, as a longtime practitioner, I've spent 30 years as a human capital uh, practitioner, so like so many of you, looking after analytics and talent management and talent acquisition, a variety of, of different functions within the human capital space. Uh, second, I get to spend, it's a privilege to spend so much time with uh, wonderful Workday customers. Thank you to anyone uh, who is a Workday customer today or planning to be a customer or was a customer. We're so grateful. Uh, if you know the analyst Josh Burson, Josh refers to me as a pollinating bee, traveling across the Workday community, sort of sharing ideas. And so I'm happy to do that today. And then I have the incredible privilege to spend lots of time with academic and forward-looking uh, thought leaders, folks like John Boudreau at USC on the future of work, uh, folks like Amy Edmondson at Harvard on psychological safety, my good friend uh, Rob Cross at Babson, who's doing such good work. And so I'm sort of gonna weave those things together. And then for the last year, I've had the responsibility to lead or be the curator for what we call CHRO Connect, where we've been bringing together a variety of uh, thought leaders, uh, what we call change makers, who are really looking at what we call the ideas for a changing world. And ideas is an acronym for five of the most pressing people imperatives that at least we're seeing. Uh, the, the acronym IDEA stands for inclusion and belonging, uh, digital acceleration, enabling experiences, the agile organization, which Phil, you tested my agility there a moment ago, and finally, the skills imperative, which I know we'll talk a little bit about. And so today, what I'd love to do is maybe set the table for the discussion with Phil and some of the things that he is one of the best uh, people analytics uh, professionals in the space that I believe we have today. Um, but I'd love to set a bit of the table of at least where I see CHROs with a perch of 30 years in the human capital space um, are, are sort of seeing what's happening in the world today. So what Phil and I would love to share today is a little bit of thinking about preparing for the next world of work and why I believe, as I mentioned to Al a number of times, I believe the people analytics function is the most important function in human capital space today. It is what is either prepares or doesn't prepare us for the next uh, world of work. Love to talk today a bit about the great resignation, uh, why we're seeing that, uh, channel some of the analytics and perspectives from the people I get the privilege to spend time with from a broad perspective and give you some resources to look into, but I mostly would love to today with the with the with my good friend Phil look beyond the immediateness of the Great Resignation and really look at this idea that we at Workday refer to as the Great Regeneration. Yes, there are imperatives to deal with today, but really, what moving forward? How do we make sure we're creating a value proposition, a workplace that attracts? people that helps them be successful. There are so many imperatives facing us. And then we'd love to geek out with Al and with you all with uh, with questions and ideas. So hopefully that's a reasonable agenda for today. So I'm just going to kick us a little bit off on what I'm seeing in preparing what I refer to as this sort of next world of work. I mentioned 
my good friend John Boudreau earlier, for those of you who may or may not know John, he is really, I think, one of the, along with Al and, and many people in this audience, one of the world's most forward and, and, and thoughtful leaders on the future of work and the workforce. And I had the privilege to work with John a number of years ago. We brought together uh, pretty similarly a community of, of, uh, of HR leaders to really look 10 years into the future. And for those of you who are familiar with the idea of scenario planning, which was originally made popular by Ari Degas back in the day at, uh, at Shell, uh, and then written uh, subsequently in a, in, a, in a number of books um, that I would strongly recommend, uh, recommend taking a look at. But what Ari Degas and, and crew really looked at was this idea of imagining a set of probable and impactful worlds. And so I had the privilege to write the first chapter in the book that we, we wrote called Black Holes and White Spaces. And, and the first chapter of this book is also available for free on Amazon. We wanted to make it available to the community. But just to maybe give you a sense of what we looked at then, and this was about six or seven years ago, relative to 10 years into the future, I think it offers us some important insights and maybe perspectives to how we continue to operate in a, in a VUCA world, a world that continues to provide such uncertainty. And so just as maybe a practical example, uh, six or seven years ago, we identified uh, really five fundamental forces that we considered would have be highly probable and highly impactful. They're perhaps a little bit less relevant. I, I, I uh, would have been surprising if we had identified a global pandemic as one of those things, but we saw these number of trends. And if you're familiar with that practice, we then boil those down into two themes. Uh, I am a recovering consultant. I spent 10 years at Accenture and so still think about the world in sort of two by twos. And we imagine that a world where the democratization of work may be moving less from roles as a point of primacy and to work as a point of primacy and technology empowerment would be important to think about. And so we literally created that two by two. And while we didn't anticipate something like a global pandemic, what I do think is interesting in looking back, we identified these future states. One of them was, imagine we had highly technologically empowered and the democratization of work that we would sort of be uber empowered, um, uh, curating work to people outside of perhaps their job. We imagine sort of work reimagined, uh, maybe perhaps the democratization of work, uh, but lower on the technology empowered. And what, the reason I share this, and I think it's interesting, especially for this amazing community of people, I really believe that you all are in a position to be in the front of the human capital function, to be there with our business leaders and saying, from the data we see, from the research, from our analysis, these are probable future states that could impact us. And as I've mentioned to Al in the past, and my good friend Phil knows for quite a while, I really believe that traditional sort of human capital management folks like myself, folks that grew up in HR, we've been primarily trained to think in certainty, to create certainty, to provide policies maybe over principles. And I think that we're in as we operate in this VUCA world where you all can help us, where this community of people can help us consider these future states. And what I will tell you is as I think about the companies that were part of this uh, future state consideration, thinking about and imagining if I needed to move on a dime and see the democratization of work in a more technologically empowered world, what would that look like? And what I'd like to suggest, at least from where I sit today, I do believe we're likely seeing what, what is commonly referred to as sort of a K recovery. We're seeing people that are sort of on two sides of what I refer to as the COVID chasm. While I believe that we are all in, uh, in, in the same storm, uh, each organization and candidly, each individual is in very different boats. And I do believe we'll see a sort of split of where you have those organizations who weren't prepared for the future, who didn't have the sensing and sense-making capabilities that you all are providing for organizations. We're probably today more disconnected, disengaged, and perhaps even dis disinterested, which is, which, is, which is horrible, by the way, I believe, uh, and that you see that the, there's sort of a, a group that's there. And then you see the leaders uh, and organizations that I'm sure are part of your organizations, given the fact that you're even part of this conference and community that are continually sensing looking for insights and then taking action, which my good friend Phil has helped and taught me to do over time. And I do think that there is this uh, chasm that is growing and that moving forward, we'll see those people who are 
continuing to be reacting to things like the great resignation or trying to get their technological digital acceleration on board, it's gonna be very hard for them to catch up to those organizations who already have the sensing insight and action capability. And so we'd love to dive a little bit today into this idea of the reaction around the great resignation. And I'll give you some context for that. But we'd love to also focus on the great regeneration. What are organizations doing moving forward to, uh, to build places that attract and enable and support their workers? And so I'll channel for a moment here, my good friend, Kevin Martin, who's the chief research officer at I4CP. Kevin recently did a, he and I did a session, which I'll show, I'll, I'll make a reference to in a moment if you wanna see it's publicly available. But their great research looked at where they could view high performance organizations. They overwhelmingly saw change uh, as an opportunity, uh, as the opportunity to engage and disrupt and build competitive advantage. Actually, the high performing organizations saw that three times more so than in their studies, the low performance organizations, which didn't have a lot of resilience, didn't have that sense making capability, were overwhelmed or viewed change as a threat, didn't see the winds of change as, as, uh, as, as in the sails, but saw it as blowing them over, if you will. And so again, I'll reference in a moment the, the research, you, be, you can uh, see what Kevin and I had put together there. So let me take us just quickly to our second chapter and I'll begin to invite my friend Phil in. This idea of the great resignation. If you're not familiar with a couple of these reports or this is a particularly new idea, strongly recommend you look at the Microsoft report on the next great disruption around hybrid work and are we ready? The enormous amount of data that they can look at um, is just, just brilliant. And they're suggesting that you know about 40% of all employees We'll either be looking for a new role at a new company, we'll be looking for new roles within organizations, or actually many people looking for entirely new careers. And so whether it's you call it the talent tsunami or other context, we have a really significant number. Our friends at I4CP even have a higher number of people who are anticipating this great talent exodus. They would suggest that 72% of people are looking for this move. And Phil will talk a little bit about his insights on that. Some of it is from the uh, non-movement in 2020, sort of pent up demand, but it is much bigger than that. And what really strikes me about the I4CP research is this statistic on 54%, according to the I4CP research, would suggest that the exodus will occur in critical roles and among designated high potential folks. So we don't just refer to it as sort of the great resignation, it's the, I think about it as the great talent resignation. And I wanna talk just for a few moments and then again, invite my friend Phil into what we see driving that. Again, I'm gonna reference the I4CP research that Kevin shared on a recent webcast that he and I did. Obviously, and we're gonna talk about this in a moment, burnout, wellness, mental wellness, physical wellness, career wellness, just all of the incredible demands, especially for those who are frontline workers, um, who I'm just personally so grateful, those people who kept us fed, clothes, uh, kept the supply chain going. Uh, we just see so much burnout. Interestingly enough, we see that the second largest reason is advancement in career opportunities. And when I speak with CHROs and other HR leaders, they're really surprised by that. They, they say, well, gosh, really during a pandemic, did people expect that we were gonna be leaning in to, uh, to, to this context of, of, uh, of career opportunities. But what I believe is true and the people I spend time with and talk to is what's true, I believe for many of us now is this psychological narrative of to survive and thrive in uncertain times. We absolutely need to be building new skills, new experiences that what the pandemic shared for us as Phil was talking about is this idea of agility. And so I do believe that that, that people are looking for career experiences, opportunity to build new skills, new capabilities, so that at the end of the day, they'll have the, the opportunity uh, to do things. They'll have the optionality to look for new opportunities, which is definitely what we saw as a driver in the pandemic. So I won't go through you know, all of those items, but I will tell you, and I think Kevin, again, I'm so grateful for Kevin sharing these. We look at lack of development coming up, requirements around well-being and safety. And Phil's gonna talk about that dissatisfaction with work and projects. Are they helping me build new skills? 
Uh, and then ultimately sort of this idea of disengagement due to uh, remote work, the burnout that we're seeing. And Phil will definitely talk about uh, a, a passionate area for he and I, which is this idea of connections. So what I'd love to do is also point you to, and then go into the, the regeneration uh, piece in a moment, is really share publicly available. Uh, we did a webinar, my good friends, John Boudreau and Amy Wright on the great resignation, some of the tactics, and that's a great place to go and learn more. We had limited time today, but I wanted to at least introduce that. And then Kevin Martin was kind enough again to join me and share how to use intelligent listening systems to engage and retain employees, which I think are things that you all will really appreciate. Now I'd love to uh, bring my good friend Phil into the conversation as well. And I really believe as we pivot foundational to this next age of work to how you all and we all can work together is this idea of continuous sensing insights and action. Here happens to be an example of what my good friend Phil and our workday leaders can see on a, on a, on a, a daily, if not weekly basis with what we call Feedback Friday. But Phil, maybe I'll invite you into to tee up a little bit of what we're seeing here and how it matters for us at Workday as we shift from some of the strategies around the great resignation to really rebuilding this next stage of work on the, the next, the, the regeneration. Yeah, thanks, Greg. And I, I appreciate the, the tee up on the <laughs> COVID chasm between the great resignation, the great regeneration. And I think we do have to balance between a short-term reaction to what we're seeing in uh in in our organizations to a long-term um, strategy setting and i think what's important and what's relevant about this continuous sensing and insights and action and, and by the way this is from a, a good view from our pecan product is it provides a bit of both it provides you with a you know i daily because people can fill it out at any time during the day even though we pulse every every friday but it does give you a sense of where are the major kind of burnout or fatigue uh, areas currently? What do we have to swarm towards, right? And and it gives you the drivers be be behind uh, growth and trajectory and about whether people feel like they're they're growing, uh, goal setting, autonomy, and um, and around diversity, inclusion, and health and well being. And so those should be the everlasting ones you're monitoring. And then if it goes down, then you kind of pivot and swarm towards that. And I, I want to just tee you up for a quick story, Greg. And, and the story is we did see some of that um, um, troubling signs in different parts of the organization. And then we deployed you, Greg, to go out to intervene and have that conversation. I wanted to tee you up on that just to give a real life example of how this works. Yeah. And so, Phil, you and I have been such tremendous partners. I'm so grateful for your. And one of the things to your point, what I love about this and where I think it's so essential for where we need to be moving forward. We can't boil the ocean on these. I've spent so much time in my career regressing these numbers to the mean, if you will. And what I love, and maybe I'll just point out to your point on the left-hand side, is the metadata cuts on these things, this sense of intersectionality. And so as you, you were kind enough, as an example, to immediately turn our feedback Friday, you had that infrastructure in place. We had you know, north of 80% of our workmates every Friday would participate in that. And we discovered particularly that our colleagues in, in Warsaw, Poland were feeling uh, an especially sense of Zoom fatigue, of, 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 of sort of well-being a challenge, given the unique role that they had in supporting so many different functions. And so you were kind enough to literally send me a Slack. And, and, and for those of you who may be old enough, sort of it would have been a danger Will Robinson hey, very specifically, our colleagues in Warsaw are seeing some of the challenge. Could you go and help them do a session? Could you meet with our site leader there, who's a wonderful and amazing leader? And I had a chance to connect with her. We used the data to understand where there was an opportunity. And then I had a human empathy session with a couple of the senior leaders, understood where some of the opportunities were, and then had the, the privilege to work with those uh, our, our colleagues in Warsaw and talk about why our brains were suffering from Zoom fatigue. What were some strategies to look at the micro stressors? Uh, how do we think about collaborative overload? And I was able to channel some of the social uh, science and the social neuroscience to help those colleagues. And Phil, thanks to you being able to say, hey, not build a program for our entire company, not boil the ocean on all of this challenge, but while Pleasanton and Paris and you know Pittsburgh were doing okay, 
our colleagues in Poland were really suffering and, and you needed, we, they needed help. And, and luckily we saw that that session was really, really well received. We got them sort of back on the tracks. Uh, it is a bit of a game of whack-a-mole, as you know. You go and you work on on one group, and then and then you have a challenge. But I'm so grateful that the ability to have this type of of, of heat map to know specifically here are those opportunities, Phil. I think you've unlocked and unleashed our capability by helping us be super specific around where we need to go, deploy resources to help people get back, and then literally weeks later see if if we've seen a result. Yeah, and I love that story because you do what you do best, Greg, <laughs> which is um, create chain in an organization and uh, elevate the experience and then allows us, uh, people analytics, to say we have these kind of resources to, to, to deploy, not to just call you a resource, Greg, you're a great partner, but deploy you to elevate that experience. And that's why we think, I think, moving forward as we move into, you know, what the great regeneration is this continuous sensing insights and action is the baseline, the infrastructure for that to build on. And Phil, I mean, I just want to take, I know we have limited time here and Al's going to get on this, but but that's a change. You know, I've been in this space for a long time and I will say for, for probably 25 of my 30 plus years in the human capital space, I thought about analytics. Kindly is a bit more of an afterthought. I thought about it as let's see the impact we have. I believe that the future is a 180 degree shift. I need to look to you, Phil, to say, Greg, this is where you need to go. This is where the priority is. This is where the opportunity. And it's really both ends. It's being able to sense and see around the corner. To your point, let me be a resource to go do my thing. Tell me where to go, coach. I will get that done. And then you tell me, hey, did it have an impact? Are we making progress? I think this is a really fundamental change completely away from the level of maybe you know reporting and other things that we saw many years ago but i believe this is essential for operating in this new vuca world if you will and uh, and again I, so I, I just love the way that partnership works and i'm absolutely happy to be deployed as a resource to go get it done for you coach when you tell me hey here's here's where you go here are your marching orders go get it done man yeah thanks <laughs> So maybe we could just shift and, and spend the rest of, of, of our time. We get about five or six minutes on this great regeneration. And Phil, I'd love to hear you because you're so creative. You're so thoughtful. And I, 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 I'm just so grateful that we have you as an example at Workday and so many other people to tell us, how do we think about these insights? And so maybe going a bit to this idea of that scenario planning that I talked about uh, earlier is I would suggest that there are sort of three things we're seeing that you're telling me that other people I spend in this space, and I'd love to maybe double click into each of these and get your thoughts. So one I do think is we're gonna see this need for greater humanity. I, I think there has never been a more important time to think about people in the context of work uh, and specifically their overall health and well-being, and we'll talk more about that. This second idea, which you and I personally geek out a ton on, we know now that that what we've been candidly deprived of is this connection in a world where our, our brains and our bodies require connections to, to maintain our, our health and our well being, to generate new ideas, and so to feel a sense of belonging. And so there are so many more reasons to look at the importance of monitoring and measuring connections. And then finally, on the geeky side, is this idea of workforce creation whether it's agile organizations, whether it's just being responsive and, 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 and as part of an organizational agility, I do think that what will likely happen a macro trend is moving away from jobs as the point of primacy to work as the point of primacy and then curating people using skills, which I believe is the new uh, capability currency. The capabilities are the, new, are the new currency. So maybe we could talk a little bit, Phil, about how you're thinking about each three of these. If these are three probable high impact parts of this great regeneration. How are you looking at them from an analytics perspective? How are you creatively applying some of these ideas? Yeah, thanks. And, and thanks for teeing that up on, on that. And if you can, you know, kind of pivot, well, just, um, just a couple of examples. So around greater humanity, I think that um, a couple of things, we, we touch on this idea of listening and intervening around physical and mental well-being. I think we're going to continue to automate that. I know 
I slacked you uh, in, in, in the past, but really what we're doing here at Workday is we're providing an infrastructure so that every manager knows the current state of the kind of health and well-being on their team and that they'll they have the resources to take interactions and we do this at a local scale and then we we scale that up and one of the stories i shared in the previous session with al is how much um not only do we care about this and because we can see the impact on productivity and we can see the impact on retention but our senior leaders care about it so much so that you know anil our, our ceo and chief people officer ashley had committed to doing thank you fridays which is taking every other friday off uh, during the summer and this is uh, i think that's a great um, way to saying that we're investing in you and it's a great way to say we care about our employees and the going forward, we're going to continually pull that string through. And I, I'll just give you one case in point here. Um, when we were uh, looking at empathy, for example, on this focus of greater humanity during uh, pre-pandemic and then kind of during pandemic of our managers, what we found, interestingly, is that those managers who had the highest level of empathy were actually you know, we're, we're rated pretty good managers prior to the pandemic, but they weren't rated as, let's say, the best managers there. But then when the pandemic hit, the teams felt that those managers who had the greatest empathy were the best leaders in the organization. And so we saw this shift when it came to this um, laser focus that our managers had on, um, on empathy and understand their employees that made their teams more uh, comfortable, less stressed, and more productive. And I think we're gonna continue to see that as we continue to have uh, instability mm -hmm. or uncertainty in the future. Uh, and then the last thing I would say and, and, and tee this up is that th what our employees want is an inclusive and equitable organization. It's loud and clear. We see that both in the PECON data, our employee sensing data at Workday and PECON's global data sets of millions of data points, employees want inclusivity and equity. And those, I think, are going to continue to last. And we need to be laser focused on that in, in order to create this regeneration, which is the opportunity we have right now. Yeah. And Phil, if I could, I know Alice, like you guys are going way over time. I got to get to it, but I'm going to I'm just going to get a build on that. What I one of the things I so appreciate about you and your background is you also, in addition to being a great analytics leader, are a, are a wonderful social scientist. You are thinking about not just the statistics which you're brilliant at, not just the machine learning and the technology which you're brilliant at, but I, I one of the things I really value is the conversations we're having, uh, and we've had you know in my previous role as looking after talent for Workday before before our good friend Chris Ernst took that over. But we were thinking about we were reading the literature, we were seeing those things, and we had a sense that empathy was one of those things. And then you went out and tested that, and in fact saw it. So that sense of having hypothesis, looking at the context and saying these things might be true or might not be true. And then when we find that to be able to really share and say, this is something we should double click into. So it's not, again, it's, it is your combination of being a great social scientist and understanding organizational behavior and being a great business person and understanding where it impacts the business and then being able to go look and say, hey, there's a there there, we've got to double click in that. Yeah, exactly. And just a quick shout out on the greater humanity recently did a master class on diversity, inclusion, equity and belonging um, analytics with uh, um, Stacia uh, from Red Thread and Al came in and hosted that session. And there's a compelling need, some of the stats that employees really feel super passionate about this area and that we have not as made as much project um, progress as we liked. So we need to double down on making progress. And that's going to be, this is not something that was a, a summer or a year. If we don't continue to do that, we're going to, we're going to lose those employees, lose the high talented people to organizations who are really embracing this. Now, yeah, let's pivot into our second connect. Our, our second kind of uh, one is around connections. You know, I, I, I cite this and I know the Microsoft research uh, that was uh, cited here, this great work, um, that they did, which looking at all the patterns of people connections, um, that connections were severely impacted during the pandemic. Uh, people's uh, social networks shrunk, they closed down and became more insular. We saw teams interacting more with each other and that has broader implications. One, 
Um, employees want to be around other people to build those strong connections. And that's the drawback that many uh, employees have to come to an office is they want to come for connections, but do the work in you know a, a flexible setting wherever they find the most flexibility. Um, and this is the biggest opportunity, I would say, continues to be an opportunity as we move forward here. And so you can, I'm just going to geek out on a couple of things and then Greg, because you're like in, in the depth. So what actually happened? Let me just demonstrate what actually happened. What ha happened during the pandemic is a couple of things. One, our bonding ties uh, actually increased. So this is a, a network of uh, a department of an organization inside um, a workday. And you can see the kind of clusters of colors. Those ties or connections actually increased. The number of connections from our research of people giving anytime feedback to each other actually increased. People are giving more feedback. They're connecting more often, but they're connecting more within their team. And that's good because it increases productivity, alignment, and trust. However, the bridging connections, uh, which is the ones across the teams, which uh, create uh, innovation in energy and coordination around things. Those are the ones that shrunk during the pandemic. And we need to be thoughtful and strategic on our talent practices in order to bring those back and reconnect organizations, Greg. And I know that's a big thing for, you know, a big focus for you. And it's also, I think, an imperative for every organization who's managing in this hybrid uh, work environment moving forward. And, you know, Phil, what I'd build on that, I know we're, we're super limited on time and happy to, to talk, you and I to talk with anyone about this. If you, it's, it's central for innovation, long-term innovation. The other thing I would add on, and it's a really interesting insight when we look at this, is that that, that notion of during the pandemic, we, we surrounded our team, we, we, we put our arms around people from a bonding perspective and productivity went up. But, you know, it's so many of the senior leaders and the managers whose work are really around the bridging ties. Their work is essentially cross team. And so lots of the reason we're seeing, I think, senior leaders and, 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 and more leadership have a need to come into the offices because they have been mostly affected by this network atrophy. In fact, some of the research would suggest four times greater affected than the average worker who actually feels a pretty good sense, but their work is primarily in the, in the bonding space. Then we also see people who have this sort of heads up or bridging work our sales professionals, our legal professionals, our marketing, maybe people who, so it just, I think it's an interesting and important lens when we think about how we redesign the future of the workplace and how people come together either in heads down or heads up work and think about this idea of, of bonding and bridging ties and really be building for what people need, what our brains crave rather than perhaps what, you know, what, what might just be on the, on the surface. Yeah, Phil, exactly. I don't know, can, you, can you touch for one second on skills and then we'll we'll invite Al back into the conversation. Yeah. Like you guys, I, I, I'm playing the music. You're not hearing it. You haven't <laughs> not seen the hook. He, he knows what he was getting into when, when he invited us on here. So that, there's no 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 surprise on that. Plus, we are passionate about what we do. I think the last thing is, and, and you, you pointed this up, is that um, I think many people were surprised that employees did want to grow their careers during the pandemic. In fact, I believe that's the one of the main reasons why uh, employees are leaving um, um, here is they have a little bit of sense of security and they haven't felt like they can grow their skills as much. And so one of the things that that we do here at Workday is really uh, look at what you call, Greg, skill flow or a continuous set of skills that our workforce is having. And this is something our leaders are paying attention to. What are the top skills in our organization? What are the skills that we're hiring for? Where are the skills that are trending? How are how are skills being picked up with learning? And that's not only relevant for the employee who wants to grow their skill set to be more agile and to have more career opportunities, which we provide from gigs to a talent marketplace to learning, but it's important for a leader who needs to plan for the future of their workforce. If I'm you know, growing in, in the financials area, we need more FINS consultants who understand the implementation. Are we really growing those key skills across there? And so on the next slide, Greg, you'll see, we have a very, uh, we look at critical skills, so skills that are so important for the future of our workforce. We're looking, we're monitoring, we're making plans. And that's what we mean by uh, workforce curation is really getting very granular at the work that needs to be done and the skills that enable that work and plan for it from that perspective. 
Yeah, and maybe Phil, I'll I'll, I'll capstone with that. It just uh, I was having a a conversation with my good friend uh, um, Marin Wagner, who looks after workforce strategy for Walmart. No small job, and I think Marin has it absolutely right when she thinks about this relationship between the growth strategy of the company, what needs to be done, and interpreting that in this sort of skill force, in this context of what skills do we have on a daily basis? What skills are we acquiring? What skills are we growing? And then perhaps what skills are attriting out of the organization? But you know, I really believe that the future of agile organizations, the future of executing against a strategy is doing exactly what you're doing, Phil, and measuring on a daily basis What's the likely impact of our ability to deliver on that business and growth strategy relative to the flow of skills in and out of the organization today? And again, put you at the center of the, the, the plate as it relates to helping us understand if we can execute on our business strategy. And I think that's not just you, I think that's a role for, for so many of the other, other folks here. So maybe Phil, we'll, we'll stop there and uh, <laughs> let Al get a word in edgewise if, if, if possible. <laughs> yeah, he, hey, he always has some questions. I, I, I don't, I don't need. I, I'm good. I, I'm just here. Oh, I'm taking pages yeah, of notes uh, here. Like, uh, I imagine. Time there. That skills is so um, relevant right now because the um, because employees really want to grow their skills right now. It's like something we can't underestimate. So I just I can't say that enough. And that's going to be ongoing. That's going to be permanent as we look through the future of work. So. Hey, well, well, you know, thank you, gentlemen. I mean, it's super impressive, um, your narrative around this. And I, I feel hopeful and energized listening to, to you both. Um, I want to uh, do something uh, a little bit off script. Um, and I want to highlight a real life example. So there are many CHROs who are out there, you know, publicly who are all saying the right things, you know, the great, uh, you know, uh, uh, and I'll just say um, regeneration is now in my head, <laughs> but you know, it's like, there's people leaving the workforce, many women exit the workforce. I obviously diversity, equity, inclusion are prominent themes. And then tactically, within HR functions from learning, onboarding, to comp, um, to communications, you know, on down the line, there's struggle. And so it invites the idea that there's this knowing doing gap. There's these great intentions, but the actual making it happen at scale, at speed it, it is missing. And so I have my own narrative around why these gaps exist and how to solve them. But I'm really interested, starting with you, Greg, and your work with CHROs. Uh, do you sense that there's this um, knowing doing gap? And if so, what do you think is being done to, to shrink it? Yeah. So Al, again, you, 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 you've gone into one of the mo most, in most, I think one of the most important and interesting things. So first of all, anyone who's in HR, I want to thank you all. I mean, what, what an incredible, I know my good friend, Phil, my HR colleagues, we have all been tested in a way that no one, none of us could have ever imagined. And I think for the most part, everyone has done an amazing job. And so full kudos and credit. At the same time, Al, I think two things are happening. I think we are we are past the, the pivot point, past the, the turning point on, I've been doing this for more than 30 years. I have never seen so many significant high impact imperatives bearing down on the human capital function at one time. I mean, this is 10 times what I've seen in a 30 plus year career. So we have an exhausted group of people. We have this pivot point that, that is now happening. And so I will tell you, I mean, the only way I know and I'm not, I'm not as smart as my good friend, Phil, but the only way I know how to pivot through this is to be using analytics, which is my, my opening comments. We have to know, we cannot boil the ocean. You cannot address these issues. You have to be, these have to be surgical understandings of that group of people needs help right now or else we'll be boiling the ocean. So I believe analytics are absolutely critical. And then Al, is, as you and I have talked about, I, ha I have to believe we have to use technology. Obviously, I'm biased on that, but I can't imagine if we don't automate and augment so many of the functions we've historically done, there'll be no way to have the human capacity to elevate what only humans can do, to do the types of empathy sessions that I talked about. Phil found in the data, the smoke alarm went off. He said, go you know, meander over to our colleagues in Warsaw and double click and see if they need help. They were like, 
thank God you came. We rang the bell, right? You know, and I showed up and we were able to address that. So I think we've got an exhausted group of people, understandably. We have this pivot point of the greatest amount of, 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 of imperatives falling on us at once. And I have to believe we have to use the insights and analytics to automate and augment so that we can elevate. That's We've not done that, Al, in the history of this function. Um, mm -hmm. And so I do think there is a gap in this fundamentally new way and embracing those ideas of saying what got us here really will not get us there. We are in a completely different game and we have to use new strategies to, to, to move forward. The, you know, thank you for that for a host of reasons. And it then invites the question, do CHROs and others who are commissioning resources towards people, data and analytics understand what the investment needs to be, both in terms of people, process, uh, technology and governance? I would say no, um, because they haven't Probably grown up yet. with it. Not, not, yet. Yet. not yet. Probably not yet. I would agree. And that's probably that's part of what we're doing here is you know laying out you know what the investment needs to be and which I'm going to throw over to Phil. Phil, you know you as you shared before, you are a people analytics practitioner within Workday, so your customer is Workday leadership and other stakeholders within that organization. So you're one of us. <laughs> so with that, you know you probably have more resources than most. Um, so it's like you know, just calling that out. That being said, there are certain uh, team structures that you've architected. There are certain data and projects that you've prioritized and things that you've consciously not done. So can you speak to just at a high level, you know, some of the key tenets of what you consider in building a people analytics capability, not only team, but capability? Yeah. Thanks. Uh, uh, being the practitioner, um, certainly I think about this every single uh, every single day. I think being at Workday is a great uh, experience because I I do have some of those resources uh, that is available, but also the expectation has shifted quite a bit. The expectation is you have these resources available, this technology, you need to do a lot more with less, like less people. And, and this is the shift that I'm talking about, Al, where historically we've been a very white glove function, doing analysis, putting it on your desk, doing the PowerPoint, and moving forward, we have to have uh, we have to have products and technology to scale that. So going back to Greg's example um, with Workday People Analytics, um, our, I, I don't know what's going on across the system. Um, our HR partner who oversees this business and is following this issue gets a story that's relevant for them. They take action. I don't even know about it, but it helps, right? And that's what technology should be doing. Um, as far as what the investments are, I think People Analytics has to do a better job at informing our leaders about what we need. Um, mm -hmm. We are an expensive resource in HR. I understand this, but we need um, product managers. We need technologists, and then we need um, storytellers. And to tell people, <laughs> to tell our our senior leaders, CHROs, Greg, Greg, I need this, and he's like. I, where would I hire a product manager in HR? Good question, right? That's what we have to start uh, solving for. And um, product management is is a key one. Design thinking, storytelling, and then a technologist. And if we align on those resources, then it creates the scale. So I, I think those are the main resources, but we need to do a better job informing our senior leaders of the resources that we do need to be successful. Hey, Al, maybe just to underline what Phil, so one of my favorite things about Phil, there's so many favorite things, it's a long list. You can tell I'm head of the Phil Wilburn fan club. <laughs> um, but what I love about, one of the things I've, is that when Phil talks about productizing things, I think he's a thousand percent right. Uh, and we joke within Workday, I joke when we talk about our customers, he has actually created what I enduringly call Phil bots. He has ident proactively identified things that are important Workday scans for them on a daily basis and it sends, I'll give you a very practical example. We, uh, succession planning is important to us. We're a high growth company. We wanna make sure that we're both managing our risk but growing our people. And so it's it's a super simple notion, but, but, but if someone has not updated their succession plan in a certain period of time, they receive a note and it says, dear Greg, it looks like it's been about so long since you've updated your succession plan. You understand why that's important. Here's a quick video on why having a pipeline of leaders is important. And, uh, and, and you know, when you get a chance, here's a link. 
and it's signed by my good friend Phil. And then what people tell me is they're, they're so such big fans of Phil, they're like, I don't know how he does it. How does he have time to be analyzing? And they'll send him a note and say, Phil, thanks for having my back. I'm helping one of our great customers. Just moved my daughter back to school. Didn't have time to do it, but I've updated my succession plan. Thanks for the note. And, and Phil doesn't have the heart to say, it's not really me. I don't have your back, Sally. It's a Phil bot. I, I program the system to look for things that could be important. And then I send behavioral nudges. I think this productization so that someone can know and then apply human judgment, automate, augment, so that we can elevate essential human capabilities. But I think Phil is one of the best in the world at doing this and it gives him scale to meet our growing business. I, I love that so much. Now I got this image of this bot with a beard and glasses. Outstanding. And what you're describing is what I had uh, talked about in People on 3.0, you know, several years ago. Um, but there's one thing that it's one thing to talk about, but it's another thing to prioritize and, and make happen uh, for reasons that you're citing. And that goes back to the need to have ample resources because this doesn't happen because you you know, just wish it to happen. It takes focused effort, which leads into my another question. And I, there's some questions that came in on the Q um, uh, and A. And in fact, I'm going to uh, check this off. Um, uh, what does the ideas stand for? Number one, and uh, I just want to make sure what came through is is right. And I think it is. Um, is it inclusion, digital acceleration, enabling experiences, agile organization, and skills? Is that right? Skills imperative. Yes. Yep. Okay. Skills imperative. Got that. And uh, does Workday have an external training for people, data geeks, wanting to skill up? They call Phil. He he. <laughs> Just training in his spare time <laughs> in between raising his kids. Hey, look at all the happy, smiling faces go up. That's I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, uh, still, yeah. We do have a great uh, workday um, reporting and analytics training. So if you're work, working on the workday system, our uh, uh, our learning partners have great courses, both live and virtual, that really helps around there. Um, I think that is really helpful. I'm going to do a plug. I believe that um, data storytelling is is really huge. So Duarte does an amazing data storytelling training uh, for anybody who wants to level up their ability to translate uh, uh, ideas and insights into actions. They do a fantastic one. So a little plug for them, but also Workday has this great reporting and analytics training that's available. Oh, th thank you uh, for that. And so I want to go back to the question that that I had. You know, we have probably you know five minutes or so. Uh, there is a lot of play around uh, people strategy, employee experience, uh, culture. You know, all these themes that arguably overlap. And then you have analytics. And I really like what you said earlier, Greg, because uh, it relates to my experience. Is that there would be an HR strategy or people strategy in the far right column? There would be how do we measure it? I'm like, wait a minute. You know, I wasn't even involved in the discussion around what technologies we adopted, what measures are going to be collected, what data is there, you know, all that. But now to your point, you know, that's changing. So as we employ design thinking, identify personas, you know, I would hope that the people analytics leader is or in those discussions, if not facilitating those uh, discussions. So I just want, you know, Greg, starting with you, these naming conventions, employee experience, do you see that kind of carrying the day? Because uh, I cite this Chinese proverb consistently that the beginning of wisdom is calling things by their right names. And we are talking past each other inside and outside of HR. And so, you know, what is kind of the connective tissue that brings all, all this together in your view? Well, I, I, I think to your point, I think that that is the big the biggest shift is to put the the analytics and the insights. And I shouldn't even say that it's really the insights. It's the sensing and insights on the front end of that process. I, I could argue and I'd, I'd be happy to have this argument with my with my wonderful workmates who I love dearly. I could argue that actually at an enterprise level, Phil and his team have the best perspective on where our opportunities, our issues are. Uh, and that's their job. We look to them to have that and increasingly so. Uh, now, I think each of our, our great business partners, our talent leaders in their domains would then have that partnership. But I would argue that perhaps, uh, and, and we'll see maybe Ashley Goldsmith, our, our, our chief people officer is on. And, and But I, I think Ashley would come back and say, you know, Phil's got a pretty good finger at his pulse of where the opportunities are. Now, Al, what I think that also 
creates is that pressure on Phil to think and translate from the business perspective. What's mm -hmm. important to our people and what's important to our business. So it's that, you know, along with uh, that, that responsibility comes great responsibility. It means he needs to understand what's important to our business. Now, Phil does that. He knows that he can look at that, as I mentioned, the social science and know, hey, this is what employee experience impacts our business. That skill matters more. And by the way, we're attriting that skill that matters is central to our business strategy. So along with that responsibility comes great response. I'm not getting the, the Spider-Man quote exactly right there, but you get the essence. <laughs> But yeah. that means you have to understand the business. I think it means you need to go upstream. It needs you, you know, you, but you have to, that's the next generation of this work to your point. It's interpreting the business strategy through all of these analytics and saying, this is what matters most. Here's what I would prioritize. Here's, and, and I can say, this is what impacts the business, whether it's people analytics or biz or performance analytics. Um, I think they're both in the same. I, I think it's much, much less around HR analytics, not, nothing against HR analytics, but this is not about, Phil doesn't, I mean, he might look at some things related. He's looking at business analytics and people's impact to these business analytics. Love it, love it. Yeah, as we start to you know wrap up now, um, you know, Phil, yeah, I love you know so much of what's been shared here, and I want to you sh just give you an opportunity to because it's the question that everyone asks. You know, it's like, what's the next step? What's you know, how do I either ex advance my organization's capability in this domain, or you know, get started? And you know, assume for a second that they have workday in place you know what would be your best next step to build this capability and over what period of time do you think is realistic to you know set expectations around it i know there's a host of variables in that you know so i, I want to you know give you a pause there give you some room to maneuver there but it is you know if you have two or three points i think that would be appreciated yeah i think um we started people analytics at workday with two people so we didn't start with a whole team and a consultant to come in and say org design. We say, with the two people, where can we break the most value, bring the most value to the organization? And what is the biggest issues with the business? And then we started from there. And so um, I think people say, oh, you need to have this big word design and you got to bring there. Actually, you likely already have the data at your fingertips. You likely have the technology available are you thinking from a product perspective? Are you automating what you can so that you can augment what's going on and then elevate what everybody else is doing? And uh, really practically, you can start with two people. You can look at what the data we have, what can we do, what, we can, what can we automate? It's so important that, that people analytics think, how can we do these behavioral nudges in the technology we have? Because then that elevates everything that we do. And so start with two people, start with one person hire an analyst, learn about your technology, and then take those insights and push that directly to people. That's what I would say. And then all of a sudden you'll feel this massive pull from the business to do all of the other cool projects that, that you need to do to support the business. And just to be clear, you know, implementing Workday or any other solution, um, you know, HR is always going to be implementing, adopting something. They're going to be so. It's not about waiting until okay. Now we're going to do this. It's about getting started. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yep. No, you're you're right. You're it's exactly started. You know, we were building capabilities because we had the creativity before Workday even could really do it. We were like, we think we can pulse all of our employees through this survey and bring it in through Prism Analytics. And Prism wasn't even released and we had already started to do that. And so um, don't wait for the perfect technology. If you understand the capabilities of it now and have some creative work through, the organization will be patient with you because you're providing value with what you do have. Well, you know, gentlemen, I could talk to you all day and there's so much to talk about the more to unpack and explore and create because I think we all agree that the future needs to be created for what's a appropriate for our organization, our internal customer base, our workforce. So, you know, I honor both of you. Thank you for contributing. Uh, closing comments, starting with you, Phil. Uh, I'm just <laughs> excited and happy to work with my friend Greg and you, Al. Uh, again, I think this is a fantastic community. And uh, the more we can bring this conversation to, to our peers and people and practitioners, the better all of our organizations are going to be. Yeah. Uh, Greg? Uh, two, 
two, two quick things. One, I think there, I, I've been doing this for 30 plus years. There has never been a more exciting opportunistic time to be in people analytics than there is literally today, like today, today. So lean in. This is, you've got boards of directors, you've got people making lots of decisions all of a sudden now about the most important priority. We've always talked about that, but we've never, today, almost everyone gets it. People and their impact, their wellness, their productivity. So you've got a, 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 a just a tremendous platform. And then I, I couldn't agree more with Phil, productize, as crazy as that sounds, you know, when, when Phil introduced Feedback Friday as a product, as a way for us to collect, that helped us understand how we preserve our culture, which is so central to our success as a company. People were like, I get it. So, you know, it, it's th those would be the two I would I would leave the group with. And thanks for the opportunity. So grateful. Well, hey, th thank you. I mean, I, I, Phil, we have a podcast coming up, you and I, but Greg, I want to invite you on the People Data for Good podcast as well, because I, it, there's so much more, again, to share and explore. So again, honor you both. Thank you. And uh, see you soon. Yeah. Stay yeah. well, everyone. Thanks, yeah. Al. Yeah, thanks, thanks for all being here. Bye-bye.